I'm Richard Strange, I'm a musician, an actor, a writer, and, uh, and now a playwright. So when I started my band Doctors of Madness in 1974, by 1975 we were sort of looking to play live. My girlfriend at the time was a, a student at tw Twickenham Art School. And in Twickenham there was a, a pub called The Winning Post, uh, just near the art school. And the students used to drink there, but at the weekends it was dead. But they had an upstairs music room. So I rather... Um, boldly went in and spoke to the uh, landlord there on a Saturday evening and it was dead as a dodo uh, and I said to him uh, do you have live music here still and he said well we used to but it didn't really work you know we're set up for it but um, I don't book anyone at the moment and there were about three people in there um, so I said to him rather grandly how would you feel about me taking the place for six consecutive Saturdays doing all the promotion and uh, I said to him only half jokingly I could double the number of people in here you know he had three people so I was on fairly safe ground there so he said well, well let's give it a go so these were the days before internet before uh, social media so everything was done analog it was done with flyers with posters with word of mouth maybe a little if we were really flush a little ad in Time Out or in one of the music papers uh, and a lot of phone calls to friends saying uh, well, we're doing this gig and it was a big thing for us to be doing a gig was 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 big because we were a brand new band so we did that first night and um, we probably had 10 12 people came the following week 20 people came the following week, 40 people came and by the end of our run we had 150 people in and it was that word of mouth thing. We were a new band. We weren't especially good, but we were different. We were different and we had a, uh, 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 an attitude. Um, and so that last night, we did a gig that sort of defined what we wanted to be. It was, it was really dynamic. It was exciting. It was born of all the frustration of not having a manager, not having a record contract, not having a van, not having equipment to speak of, not having an agent, not having a publisher. And at the end of that gig, the crowd had gone mad. We were having a little drink in our, I call it a dressing room, is giving it uh, a little bit too much uh, um, prestige, but uh, we were in a sort of broom cupboard that was our dressing room. And there was a knock on the door. And uh, a guy came in who looked slightly familiar and he said, my name's Jonathan King, right? He said, um, I don't know if you've heard of me and I heard of Jonathan King. This was before his troubles, it must be said, but I didn't like him. As a person, I didn't like him in instinctively. And even more importantly, I didn't like his band Genesis, who he was managing at the time. So he came in and we had a cursory chat and he said, are you guys looking to turn professional? And I said, yeah, we are. He said, well, I manage a band called Genesis. And I think, mm, that rules you out then, you know. Uh, anyway, he, he stayed a little while and uh, I sort of um, said thanks, but no thanks. And as, as he left, the band looked at me and said, you know, have you completely lost your marbles? Said, you know, that was our one chance we might ever have to turn professional. And he managed his Genesis. I said, I hate Genesis. I'm not interested. And they were livid, you know. So five minutes later, like waiting for buses, there's another knock on the door. And this time a cigar comes in about five minutes before the guy's smoking it. It's like... And he's a classic East End wide boy manager, pop manager. He introduced himself as Brian Morrison. He said, well, I'm Brian Morrison. I manage Pink Floyd, I manage T-Rex, I published T-Rex and the Bee Gees. And, um, I made so much money, he said, I retired. But a mate of mine came and saw you last week uh, and said, if I wanted to get back into the business, come and see this band, because I might get excited by it. He's puffing away. He said, I was quite excited. You know, he did, never wanted to, never wanted to uh, diminish his negotiating position, you know. He said, if you guys are serious, come and see me in my office on Monday and we'll talk contracts. 
So we did. We went up to Mayfair and there on the wall with the gold discs for Pink Floyd, T-Rex, Bee Gees and stuff. And sure enough, he's got a publishing contract. He used to be an agent, but in the 60s he started music publishing. And that's where he made it his considerable wealth. And he brought out the contracts and it says sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. So we signed management, we signed record production deal, we signed publishing, I think we signed agency as well. You know, by the end of that afternoon, I'd probably signed away 182% of my potential earnings for the rest of my life. But I was a professional musician as I left that office. He signed, he put us on 25 quid a week, uh, 25 quid a week each. Uh, and he said, I'm going to put you into um, a rehearsal room uh, for six weeks uh, and you can work on writing your songs doing your stage show, what you're going to wear, who you're going to be, what you're going to look like, who you are, get your identity sorted out. And that's what we did. And that was as a result of playing that pub for six weeks. It was that uh, important. It was that crucial to us. It was the way that we could just get our head above the parapet uh, and, and learn the craft as well of being in a, an environment that was not necessarily uh, uh, empathetic towards you, you know, um, that you were probably going to be uh, um, battling to a certain extent against a general hubbub rather than a hushed silence. You know, we were quite a loud band, so we had uh, an advantage from the start. We signed a, a, a deal with Polydor Records or Photogram Records and our first album came out and it wasn't everyone's cup of tea but there was a busy enough rock scene then, by then pop had become rock music, you know. We were out there and people got us to a, a, a lesser or greater extent and we were playing to anything between 600 and 1500 people a night uh, on our first headline tour because the album had come out and had got quite a lot of attention. And so we were doing the big college circuit and, and town halls and stuff. And um, my agent phoned me and said, look, I need a favor from you. I'm being driven mad by a manager in London who's got this band. You might have heard of them. Uh, they've got a bit of a naughty image, but they're sweet kids really, blah, blah, blah. They need a gig out of town. They've done one show at St. Martin's Art School, but he wants them to play out of London to, to again, learn, learn the craft, if you like. He said they're called the Sex Pistols, and can they support you in, I think, Middlesbrough? And I'd sort of heard a bit about them. I'd heard a little bit more about Malcolm than I'd heard about the band, but um, I thought, well, yeah, because I could understand that they're a bit like we were, two years previously. So I said, yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, one gig, what could possibly go wrong? So uh, I watched them do the soundtrack and they were really shabby. But then I thought, I don't really know what the fuss is about, but I'm going to watch them um, when they do their show from the side. So the doors opened and the fans came in and we probably had 600, 800 people in that night. And I noticed that some of them were affecting this short, spiky hair, this safety pin torn stuff. Um, just to uh, contextualize again, at that point, I had blue hair, I was Kid Strange, you know, we were Urban Blitz, we were Peter Dilemma, you know, we had all the names, we had the, the look, but not quite the look to be honest. Uh, and it became clear that a generational baton had been handed over. And a musical generation is only three or four years, as, as anyone knows who's got brothers and sisters. You know, you like your own music. Uh, it helps define you and your, your, your tribe, your subculture, all that stuff. Who you are, your identity. It's a good way of, uh, of, of um, protesting against uh, parental control. You know, the point of pop music, rock music back then, definitely was to upset your parents, first and foremost. It was not to be Adele and say, oh, that's nice, your parents say, or, you know, or, or like before it, 
the prog rock, you know, they'd say, oh, well, they're, they're really good musicians, you know, if he only had got his hair cut, he could probably play in an orchestra, you know. So that was not what I wanted to do, uh, nor did I want to please anyone's parents. I've always been a, a political artist and, and uh, 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 quite a kind of plastic. So, um, yeah, when the pistols came, uh, I sort of watched them from the side and I knew it was over for us because that generational baton had been handed over to kids who just wanted to play two chords and, and two minute songs uh, with a really snotty attitude, you know. And so that came like a, a steamroller at us. And uh, there we were, we had our first album was doing okay, our second album was just about ready to come out. Suddenly, punk rock was the only gig in town. We were the sort of go-to band on the road that punk rock bands could get a gig with. But, you know, I knew by 1978, we, we sort of muddled through 1977. By 1978, I thought, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life, trying, you know, trying to hold back time or hold back the tide. When I had this dream a little while back, I was sharing a needle with Scylla Black. I was doing speed and she was doing smack. Then she went down to Brixton to score some crack. I said, oh now, sir, I know right now you're high. One day, Scylla, you will die. I was in a Soho sex club with Tony Blair when she reappeared at the top of the stair. I said, Tony, I gotta have her. He said, don't you dare, but by then I was down to my underwear. I said, oh shit, Tony, I know you think you can fly. One day, Tony, you will die. <laughs> at which point, poor old Ed stood and Jim Nochty went white. And there's still another verse to go. It's only three minutes past seven. Someone is buttering up their toast right now and they hear. I was drinking communion with Damien Hurst when he said, fucking hell man, I'm dying of thirst. If I don't get a drink, I'm gonna fucking burst. Then he grabbed the wine and went, but that's why he's cursed. I said, oh shit, Damien, that's enough for powder high. One day, I bet you could guess it, you will think it will die. I said, oh, now, 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 Damien, like the sheep, the shark, and the fly. One day, Damien, you will die. Damien, you will die. Damien, you will die. You will die. You will die. I can't retire. I think you won't retire, will you? No, I can't. I can't. I enjoy what I do too much. What would I do? Play golf or something? No, certainly not. I love what I do. I am absolutely blessed. I mean, someone who's never had a music lesson in his life, never had an acting lesson. I've worked with Tom Waits, Marianne Faithful. I've worked with Tim Burton. I've worked with Jack Nicholson. I've worked with. Uh, um, uh, Robert Wilson, the stage director. I've worked with, you know, uh, Damon Albarn with Gavin Bryars. I mean, I'm absolutely blessed. And I don't, um, I don't say that with any false modesty. I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. Marines, tell Joe, he left my breakfast on a mirror. Don't believe, not a word, why he's gone. Joe moves his eyes, tries to feel a bit less helpful. 